Hello all welcome to Vinod Kumar YouTube channel. In this video I am going to make the chapter number 5 of class 7th. The name of the chapter is Rulers and Buildings Figure 1 shows the first balcony of the Kub Minor. Kubudenbach had this constructed around 1199. Notice the pattern created under the balcony by the small arches and geometrical designs. Can you see two bands of inscriptions, under the balcony? These are in Arabic. Notice that the surface of the minor is curved and angular. Placing an inscription on such a surface required great precision. Only the most skilled craftsperson could perform this task. Remember that very few buildings were made of stone or brick 800 years ago. What would have been the impact of a building like the minor on observers in the 13th century? Between the 8th and the 18th century kings and their officers built two kinds of structures, the first were forts, palaces, garden residences and tombs, safe, protected and grandiose places of rest in this world and the next, the second were structures meant for public activity including temples, mosques, tanks, wells, caravanserais and bazaars. Kings were expected to care for, their subjects and by making structures for their use and comfort, rulers hoped to win their praise. Construction activity was also carried out by others, including merchants. They built temples, mosques and wells. However, domestic architecture, large mansions, pavlas, of merchants, has survived only from the 18th century. Engineering skills and construction monuments provide an insight, into the technologies used for construction, Take something like a roof for example. We can make this by placing wooden beams or a slab of stone across four walls. But the task becomes difficult if we want to make a large room with an elaborate superstructure. This requires more sophisticated skills. Between the 7th and 10th centuries architects started adding more rooms, doors and windows to, buildings. Roofs. Doors and windows were still made by placing a horizontal beam across two vertical columns, a style of architecture called trabeate or corbelt. Between the 8th and 13th centuries the trabeate style was used in the construction of temples, mosques, tombs and in buildings attached to large stepped wells, velas. Temple construction in the early 11th century the Kandaraya Mahadra temple dedicated to Shiva was constructed in 999 by the King Danadva of the Chandila dynasty. Is the plan of the temple. An ornamented gateway led to an entrance, and the main hall, Mahamandapa, where dances were performed. The image of the chief deity was kept in the main shrine, Garbagriya. This was the place for ritual worship where only the king, his immediate family, and priests gathered. The Kajuraho complex contained royal temples where commoners were not allowed entry. The temples were decorated with elaborately carved sculptures. The Rajarajshvara temple at Thanjavur had the tallest shikhara amongst temples of its time. Constructing it was not easy because there were no cranes in those days and the 90 ton stone for the top of the shikhara was too heavy to lift manually. So the architects built an inclined path to the top of the temple, placed the boulder on rollers and rolled it all the way to the top. The path started more than 4 kilometers away so that it would not be too steep. This was dismantled after the temple was constructed. But the residents of the area remembered the experience of the construction of the temple for a long time. Even now a village near the temple is called Charuplam. The village of the incline to technological and stylistic developments are noticeable from the 12th century. 1. The weight of the superstructure above the doors and windows was sometimes carried by arches. This architectural form was called arcuate. Compare figures 2a and 2b with figures 5a and 5b. 2. Limestone cement was increasingly used, in construction. This was very high quality cement, which, when mixed with stone chips hardened into concrete. This made construction of large structures easier and faster. Take a look at the construction site building temples, mosques and tanks. Temples and mosques were beautifully constructed because they were places of worship. They were also meant to demonstrate the power, wealth and devotion, of the patron. Take the example of the Rajarajshvara temple. An inscription mentions that it was built by King Rajrachidva for the worship of his god, 
Roger H. Sparum. Notice how the names of the ruler and the god are very similar. The king took the god's name because it was auspicious and he wanted to appear like a god. Through the rituals of worship in the temple one god, Roger Ajidva, honored another, Roger H. Sparum. The largest temples were all constructed by kings. The other, lesser deities in the temple were gods and goddesses of the allies and subordinates of the ruler. The temple was a miniature model of the world ruled by the king and his allies. As they worshipped their deities together in the royal temples, it seemed as if they brought the just rule of the gods on earth. Muslim sultans and padshahs did not claim to be incarnations of God but Persian court chronicles described the sultan as the shadow of God. An inscription in the Quat al-Islam mosque explained that God chose Saladin as a king because he had the qualities of Moses and Solomon, the great lawgivers of the past. The greatest lawgiver and architect was God himself. He created the world out of chaos and introduced order and symmetry as each new dynasty came to power. Kings wanted to emphasize their moral right to be rulers. Constructing places of worship provided rulers with the chance to proclaim their close relationship with God, especially important in an age of rapid political change. Rulers also offered patronage to the learned and pious, and tried to transform their capitals and cities into great cultural centers that brought fame to their rule and their realm. It was widely believed that the rule of a just king would be an age of plenty when the heavens would not withhold rain. At the same time, making precious water available by constructing tanks and reservoirs was highly praised. Sultan El Tutmish won universal respect for constructing a large reservoir just outside Dili Ikana. It was called the Hazai Sultanate or the King's Reservoir. Can you find it on map 1 in chapter 3? Rulers often constructed tanks and reservoirs, big and small, for use by ordinary people. Sometimes these tanks and reservoirs were part of a temple, mosque, note the small tank in the Jami Masjid in figure 7, or a Gurdwara, a place of worship and congregation for Sikhs, figure 8, why were temples targeted? Because kings built temples to demonstrate their devotion to God and their power and wealth. It is not surprising that when they attacked one another's kingdoms they often targeted these buildings. In the early 9th century when the Pantheon king Shrimarishrive Labha invaded Sri Lanka and defeated the king, Sena I, 831-851, the Buddhist monk and chronicler, Damakati noted, he removed all the valuables. The statue of the Buddha made entirely of gold in the jewel palace and the golden images in the various monasteries, all these he seized. The blow to the pride of the Sinhalese ruler had to be avenged and the next Sinhalese ruler, Sena II, ordered his general to invade Majurai, the capital of the Pantyas. The Buddhist chronicler noted that, the expedition made a special effort to find and rest toward the gold statue of the Buddha. Similarly in the early 11th century, when the Kola king Rajendra I built a Shiva temple in his capital he filled it with prized statues seized from defeated rulers. An incomplete list included, a sun pedestal from the Chalakyas, a Gainsha statue and several statues of Durga, an Andi statue from the eastern, Chalakyas, an image of Bhairava, a form of Shiva, and Bhairavi from the Kalingas of Orissa and a Kali statue from the palace of Bengal Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni was a contemporary of Rajendra I. During his campaigns in the subcontinent he attacked the temples of defeated kings and looted their wealth and idols. Sultan Mahmud was not a very important ruler at that time. But by destroying temples dash, especially the one at Sumnath, he tried to win credit as a great hero of Islam. In the political culture of the Middle Ages most rulers displayed their political might and military success by attacking and looting the places of worship of defeated rulers. Gardens, tombs and forts under the Mughals, architecture became more complex. Babur, Humyun, Akbar, Jahangir, and especially Shah Jahan were, personally interested in literature, art and architecture. In his autobiography, Babur described his interest in planning and laying out formal gardens, placed within rectangular walled enclosures and divided into four quarters by artificial channels. These gardens were called Shahar Bay, four gardens, because of their symmetrical division into quarters. Beginning with Akbar, 
Some of the most beautiful shahar bags were constructed by Jahangir and Shah Jahan in Kashmir, Agra and Delhi, see figure 9. There were several important architectural innovations during Akbar's reign. For inspiration, Akbar's architects turned to the tombs of his Central Asian ancestor, Timur. The central towering dome and the tall gateway, Pishtak, became important aspects of Mughal architecture, first visible, in Humyun's tomb. The tomb was placed in the center of a huge formal shahar bay and built in the tradition known as Eight Paradises or Hasht Bayisht, a central hall surrounded by eight rooms. The building was constructed with red sandstone, edged with white marble. It was during Shah Jahan's reign that the different elements of Mughal architecture were fused together in a grand harmonious synthesis. His reign witnessed a huge amount of construction activity especially in Agra and Delhi. The ceremonial halls of public and private audience, the Waikas OM, were carefully planned. Placed within a large courtyard, these courts were also described as Chahil Sutan or 40 pillared halls. Shah Jahan's audience halls were specially constructed to resemble a mosque. The pedestal on which his throne was placed was frequently described as the Qibla, the direction faced by Muslims at prayer, since everybody faced that direction when court was in session. The idea of the king as a representative of God on earth was suggested by those architectural features. The connection between royal justice and the imperial court was emphasized by Shah Jahan in his newly constructed court in the Red Fort at Delhi. Behind the emperor's throne were a series of Pyotradura inlays that depicted the legendary Greek god Orpheus playing the lute. It was believed that to Orpheus's music could calm ferocious beasts until they coexisted together peaceably. The construction of Shah Jahan's audience hall aimed to communicate that the king's justice would treat the high and the low as equals creating a world where all could live together in harmony. In the early years of his reign, Shah Jahan's capital was at Agra, a city where the nobility had constructed their homes on the banks of the river Yamuna. These were set in the midst of formal gardens constructed in the Shaharba format. The Shahar Bagh Garden also had a variation that historians describe as the Riverfront Garden. In this the dwelling was not located in the middle of the Shahar Babat at its edge, close to the bank of the river. Shah Jahan adapted the Riverfront Garden in the layout of the Taj Mahal, the grandest architectural accomplishment of his reign. Here the white marble mausoleum was placed on a terrace by the edge of the river and the garden was to its south. Shah Jahan developed this architectural form as a means to control the access that nobles had to the river. In the new city of Shah Jahanabad that he constructed in Delhi, the imperial palace commanded the riverfront. Only specially favored nobles, like his eldest son Darashaka, were given access to the river. All others had to construct their homes in the city away from the river Yamuna region and empire as construction activity increased between the 8th and 18th centuries, there was also a considerable sharing of ideas across regions, the traditions of one region were adopted by another. In Vijayanagara, for example, the elephant stables of the rulers were strongly influenced by the style of architecture found in the adjoining sultanates of Bijapur and Golconda, see Chapter 6. In Vrindavan, near Mathura, Temples were constructed in architectural styles that were, very similar to the Mughal palaces in Fatepur Sikri. The creation of large empires that brought different regions under their rule helped in this cross fertilization of artistic forms and architectural styles. Mughal rulers were particularly skilled in adapting regional architectural styles in the construction of their own buildings. In Bengal, for example, the local rulers had developed a roof that was designed to resemble a thatched hut. The Mughals like this Bangla Dome, see figures 11 and 12 in Chapter 9, so much that they used it in their architecture. The impact of other regions was also evident. In Akbar's capital at Fatepur Sikri many of the buildings show the influence of the architectural styles of Gujarat and Malwa. Even though the authority of the Mughal rulers waned in the 18th century, the architectural styles developed under their patronage were constantly used at